Tonight's guest is Dwayne. Dwayne, welcome to the show. Hi, Vic. How are you? I'm doing good, but more importantly, how are you? I'm not doing too bad. Good. Well, that's good news then. Dwayne, please give us a brief bio on yourself. All right. Live in uh, the lower peninsula of Michigan. Spent a lot of time in the woods growing up. Earliest memory, I'd say. Well, just from looking at pictures, about three years old, uh, my dad had me in a backpack standing in the middle of a river while he was trout fishing. From there, it was almost every weekend until me and my brother and my family just all together grew up and started getting jobs and moving on. And uh, we still all individually do it, head out in the woods every weekend during hunting season. We're not at work. We're definitely hunting, doing something to... uh Make the hunting experience better, I guess. I work in healthcare. Oh, I hear a lot of stories and yeah, that's that's a little bit about myself. Considering your Woods credentials, I doubt it, but has anyone who you've ever revealed your encounters to ever accused you of misidentifying a common animal? There's really only been one person that I've actually told about my experience like actually opened up and that was my mom anybody knows how moms are they're they're usually pretty uh understanding but she definitely tried you know well maybe it was a bear or maybe it was a wolf we don't have wolves in lower michigan so that's definitely a no-go there but i've brought it up around people and everybody pretty much always just has the same reaction scoff at the idea laugh it off, or you watch too many movies, whatever. I kind of just try and keep it quiet now. Yeah, I can't say I'll blame you there. And knowing how much time you've spent in the woods where your mom has to know, I'm surprised she came at you that way. Yeah, she. Uh, I think it was more of like a comforting thing. She has uh, pretty deep Native American roots. I mean, she's in tune to a lot of different things. But I think it was more or less like, uh, just kind of throw me off a little bit. It didn't work, Mom. <laughs> no, I understand why. Unfortunately, nightmares have been one of the biggest problems you've had to deal with after having the encounters you're going to tell us about tonight. What kinds of negative effects of all these nightmares you've had, had on your life? The most important one is my sleep. I don't sleep. I work third shift so I can stay awake at night. Even so, when I lay down and go to sleep around noon, one, two o'clock in the afternoon, it doesn't work that way. It's still there. I still don't sleep. When I do sleep and I end up in one of these nightmares, I usually wake up covered in sweat, soak my sheets with sweat. My fiance wakes me up usually and That's how I know (laughs) she's all wet and (laughs) rubbing up against me while I'm sleeping. That's horrible. Yeah, for anyone listening who thinks this whole dog man thing is a joke, please remember what he just said. Yeah, this is far from a joke. Do you consider them to be just nightmares or would you say they lean closer to the night terror side of things? Definitely night terrors. Definitely. I've had nightmares. I've definitely had nightmares and nothing ever compares to what happens when I start dreaming about a dog man. It definitely sounds like they do lean closer to the night tier side of things. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, I'd say so. Without telling us any of the details from your encounters, what can you tell us about what makes your nightmares so hard to deal with? Oh man, they just, they seem so real. Almost like it could happen, you know, at any time. And usually I wake up before anything real, real bad happens. You know, but I'd say last two or three weeks, I, I don't know, maybe it was the last two weeks. The lack of sleep, you know, throws the time off. But uh, I had one and it was an experience that I've, I've never been through couldn't wake up like right away at the point when I usually do and so it was to the point where in the last one I had it's like nothing really physically happened in the night terror but there was a point where 
because there's always two. It was just like a lunging almost. And then like right at the last second, I'm like, snap myself back. Well, it goes without saying, I'm so sorry to hear you have these night tears, but thank goodness for the fact you normally wake up before they actually grab you or attack you. I guess that's about the only bright side to those experiences that we can point out. Your brother was nearby when you had that first encounter and with you when you had the second one. How much help has he been when it comes to you dealing with those two experiences? Oh, we don't talk about it at all. None's the word. He's a little different than me. He's more just, if I can't see it, I can't feel it, I can't smell it, it's not there. So he's not real good with anything like that. And he's he's had his own experiences in like West Virginia. He was stationed in Norfolk. They were out camping, I guess. And he called me one day, told me he was, they were out camping and uh, they met up with an old timer and they're just sitting around the fire. And he said, big old logs started just being thrown down the mountainside or whatever, you know, landing in the water. And when I asked him what he thought it was, well, I don't know. I I think they were doing some logging and just a few of them had slipped out and just kind of flung, rolled. And he had some wild explanation. So, yeah, he's, he's not very good with that kind of stuff. So we know what happened. And. That's where he wants to keep it. Well, that's his right to do that, but it really is a shame that he won't talk with you about the experience. That definitely doesn't help. Yeah. If you've had a dogman encounter and would like to talk with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let me know. All right, Dwayne, please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. It was, I believe, November 16th or 17th. We were up north. My brother was uh, running a hay farm for his fiance at the time's parents. After our dad passed away, 2012, I just spent a lot of time up there with them and you know, worked the hay fields. So one day we were just out riding around doing what brothers do, I guess, in the middle of nowhere. We met up with some Amish who were kind of in the area. And my brother had struck up a deal with them where they would get hay from us. And in return, we would be able to hunt their chunk of the forest. Whatever we took out of there, we'd give them like a quarter of, you know, whatever it was at the time, whether we were small game pheasant whatever deer we went scoping around and man it looked beautiful there's pine trees up north where i live it's it's pretty much between pine and oak that's that's pretty much the chunk of forest we were in. so it was just beautiful clear if anybody's ever walked through a forest where there's mostly pine say in the chunk that you're in and them needles fall and they line the floor and it's just that copper color as far as you can see you got some oak leaves beautiful it's it's amazing we call it pure michigan (laughs) that's our state slogan so that's what it is we weren't really baiting we're not allowed to really bait anymore or anything that's really worth hauling out so we'd always just go back and put like salt licks stuff like that out so the night of our hunt rifle season just started on the I think it was the 15th we were down a the gravel road first of all that took us to the trail to get back into the forest we were probably 10 miles down that gravel road and then it was a right onto a dirt road dirt track about 15 miles back Halfway through, it turned into a two-track. We get back there, beautiful day, not too cold, not too windy. Could hear all the wildlife going. It just felt good. It just felt like it was going to be a good hunt. So we parted our ways at the car, and we were hunting probably about three miles off of the track where we parked. 
is where we had our stands. My brother was, he couldn't have been no less than 400 yards from me, behind me. So it was about halfway through. We walked back and we were sitting and we had the walkie talkies and probably around six o'clock getting towards prime time in the area. And all of a sudden I started hearing what sounded like a thousand deer herd, but in reality, there's probably about 15, 20 deer. And I mean, I heard them, they were, they were hauling. I didn't even start seeing them maybe a minute. Time kind of slows down when that happens. So it was probably more like 30, 40 seconds. But I started seeing the deer run past me and I contemplated, I had my rifle up and I contemplated, probably squeeze one off, but I just sat there and just waited and everything just kind of went quiet. I had seen out of the corner of my eye what looked like a wolf. The background, though, it just stood out. I mean, I go back to that copper floor. The copper forest floor from the pine needles and the oak leaves and the dead ferns, stuff like that. And it had its, uh, I'll call them airplane ears. The ears were pinned back. Like it was up to something that was on the trail, but it was just kept running through my head. There's a wolf in front of me. I'm actually staring at a wolf in lower Michigan. I was like froze. I wanted to get a picture of it, but I also just wanted to keep staring. After a few seconds though it started like putting its head in the air sniffing around the ears came up it looked like it knew i was there it was kind of you know what what is this that i'm smelling it kind of like took a couple steps and then that's when it just like stood up and when i say stood up i mean i'm not talking like it stood straight up it had perfect posture I'll say, you know, Vic, it's not as hunched over as uh, your logo, but it definitely didn't have a straight up posture. And when I kind of gathered myself and I looked, it was like the scariest, most amazing thing I've ever seen. I froze. I It knew I was there, first of all. It could smell. It knew I was there, and it just had to find me. Now, where I was hunting, I was about 15, 20 feet up. I had like a little perfect little window where I could just see just right around me. So I kind of just like sunk back into my tree and it just kind of like walked slowly, almost like it knew now where I was and it just had to just look. It kind of got in front of me a little bit off to the right. That's when it just like stood all the way up. But when it stood all the way up, its head tilted. And I knew right then I was screwed. That, that's when I knew I was screwed. It looked right at me, knew I was there, looked dead at me. The only thing I could think to do was shaking so bad was I let a round go. That's going to go one of two ways. Either it's going to run away or I'm going to really piss it off and it's coming for me. But I had to do something. I squeezed a round off and I was using a 300 short mag or 300 mag. So it's a loud gun, a very loud gun. Anybody that hunts with a rifle knows that's that's a lot of gun and it looked right at me it just right straight in my face it walked around the tree almost like uh, how how do i easily get there is what i felt um but then again there was also maybe it didn't see me i had my face painted and maybe it just didn't see me but it knew i was there something like that i had a lot of things running through my head at the time it got to like behind me almost to the left like my back left quarter at that point i thought i was done like it was coming up behind me it was going to get up in my tree so i i ejected that shell and i just 
boom, 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 boom. Fired what I had left in my magazine. My brother texted me after the first shot. I didn't really text anything back. He asked if I got one. I said, no. And then I said, did you see anything? And he said, no. Like, all right, well, I'm going to be heading down soon. I said, no, stay there. Just stay in your tree. We'll, we'll, let's sit for a little bit longer. You can't shoot after dark. Anybody knows that. So there was really no point in us staying there. Because at this point, it was, you know, pretty dark. I mean, not extremely dark, but I told him, let's just stay for a little bit. We maybe sat for probably, I don't know, maybe 20 more minutes. And this is after I had emptied what I had left. We met back up. And he asked me what I was doing. I didn't see us. Did you, did you get anything? I said, no. Well, would you do miss? No, I don't miss. So he said, uh, you know, what the heck are you doing? I don't know, man. I thought my gun was jammed or something. I'd, I was just messing around. He was a little upset with that. Messing up our hunting spot, blah, blah, blah. So we got back to the car. We were talking and, you know, we, I just asked him, did you see that wolf? He's like, no, no wolf's down here. You might have seen a big coyote. No, definitely not a coyote. Definitely not. I left it at that. Like, whatever. He didn't see it. We got undressed. We took our camo off, whatever, and started heading back. Maybe 60, 70 yards from where we were parked. We started seeing, like, a glow. It was off in the thick to the right. I was like, man, that is a peculiar spot for somebody to, you know, be camped out and have a little fire going. But we just kind of laughed a little bit. And then we started getting closer. And it was, I want to say a person, but they had like a, you know, black head to toe, almost like a black robe, a black leather robe. They were holding a fire in a coffee can. Anybody knows a coffee can, you're not going to hold a fire in for <laughs> any more than 15 seconds. So like that's, that's some pretty thin metal. It gets pretty darn hot quick. And we just hightailed it out of there. We're not, no, nope, we're not even going to mess with that. We want none of that, whatever that is. And after the night ended and we're back at the house, I was sitting in the living room and it's a, you know, your typical, Midwest farmhouse, you know, sitting on, I think it was 40, 50 acres maybe, but surrounded by hay fields. I had a pretty close neighbor. They weren't super close, but you could see their house. Sitting, you know, just in the back area of the house in the back living area watching TV. And all I kept thinking about was what I seen. I kept trying to rationalize it. Maybe it was a bear. No, it's not a bear. It was too thin to be a bear. And it was more defined. How can I explain it? The fur was thick, but still very well defined. I mean, it matched the contour of the body. I've never seen a dark gray bear before. That's another thing that kept popping in my head. There's no gray bears. What could it have been? I had to deal with it at that point. I had to deal with the fact that I just seen something that my whole life I was told is only a movie. That's only Hollywood. No, it's not only Hollywood. These stories have to originate from somewhere for Hollywood to get the ideas that they've had for however long they've been in existence making movies old English accounts of things, these thoughts had to come from somewhere to just try and brush something off like that. And the eyes, first of all, were almost human. I don't want to say they were human, but by saying that, I mean, what I mean is you could see the intelligence. You knew what I'm looking at. That is a smart animal. That is a smart creature. I'm sorry, not an animal. I don't want to say it's an animal because who are we to classify something like that that science still hasn't 
grasped around. The ears were not like directly on the top of the head. The head is round, obviously. So like right at that rounding point is where the ears started. Honestly, I'd say they would really resembled like a Doberman's ears, but more furry, obviously. And it was like a tuft of hair, like a lynx almost, has or a bobcat, has that little bit of hair that sticks up off the tip of the ears. The face, though, that is what really sent me into that shock, oh crap moment, because it wasn't normal. It was almost like, I'm not going to say skin because there's, you couldn't see skin. It was just, extremely short hair that covered the face up to like the bottom of the eyes and then down the snout or the muzzle and when it did like the you know when a dog does the smell thing like smelling up in the air the lips kind of move up a little bit that was the scariest thing i don't want to say i didn't like sense aggression but I knew at that point I was at the bottom of the food chain. I was not the top predator in that chunk of woods at that time. I feel like it, it made that known to me. And I tried to rationalize it. Maybe I, maybe it didn't see me, but Vic, it looked right dead through that little window in the trees. It looked right at me I, and I had to deal with it. Like it knew I was there. Now what happens? Do I not ever go back to that spot again? I've never been back there since. That was in 2012. I've not been back to that spot since. When it like looked up at me and was like smelling, and I was just kind of like staring at it, I the fear that just like ran through me almost like you could see the muscle definition, okay? If that thing wanted to jump and grab me, I felt like it very well could have. Very much so. Two leaps, tree, me. Simple as that. Like I said, it made me know that I was not the top predator, but I also got that like feeling like, all right, maybe, maybe it's just, you know, gonna go. Maybe I'll just be all right. And ultimately, yeah, that's what happened. But how did it trigger those feelings in? is what I still to this day can't get my head around. The level of intelligence that I felt through that experience from that creature was insurmountable. The hands on it, I say hands, they're definitely not. Anybody who's had an experience knows they're not human hands, but they're not paws. You could see the nails and just the fur coming off the back. Going up the arms, forearms were a little bare, still had, you know, short fur, but not as long as the rest of the body. The way it stood, though, man, was it still triggers a little something inside me. Like the way it stood up is like it was unnatural. It was definitely unnatural the way it stood up. You know, at first, maybe it was a big wolf that evolved enough. This again is me trying to rationalize it after the fact, but no, that's not going to happen. They're not going to stand up and walk when they don't have to. The way it looked though, when it stood up and started walking, like that will forever be ingrained in my head. The way the fur moved with the muscles, and you could see the definition, each flex of the muscle with each step. It didn't seem like there was any fat on this thing at all. There was like no jiggle when it was walking up. Like there was no jiggle in the belly. When it stood up and everything just kind of tightened up, that was probably the most fearful thing I've, I still can't get it out of my head. That gets me every time anytime I try and talk about it I said I don't ever really talk about it now but that's the part that always gets me and so when it looked at me 
I didn't really notice any shine in the eyes. Any predator, that's how they see it. But then again, I wasn't trying to shine a flashlight down in its eyes or anything like that. It didn't have a tail. That was unnatural. Like, where's the tail? Canines have tails. Whether you chop it off at the end, there's always a nub. There was it was straight, straight back. Kind of see the spine a little bit, the outline of it. Just the fur stood up a little bit higher in that area. So the next day, it was the next day or maybe two days later, we went to the back of the house. We had a food plot back there. It was 35, 40 yards, maybe. We just had like some alfalfa and stuff like that. Some winter wheat growing back there. We would hunt. We had a little shack up on a stand about 10 feet up. I wanted to sit there. I didn't want to leave the property after, you know, the night before. I did not want to leave the property. I told Ryan, I'll sit there. When the sun started going down, is the coyotes, they started singing. And I mean, at first it was beautiful. You know, anybody that heard pack of coyotes going it might be annoying for a second but it's actually it's pretty amazing you know knowing that they're communicating it's no different than you and i talking right now but when they got quiet instantly i thought to myself no way because they got quiet and everything else was quiet everything else was quiet first because they were going but once they shut right up And you could just feel, and I thought to myself, no way, this is not, because it was still so fresh. So that's what I instantly went to. I'm like, there's, there's no way this can be happening. No way at all. It's impossible. What I seen freak occurrence, there could be no way that that's going to be over here. I'm okay. Plus I'm like 30, 40 miles away from where we were hunting. I started fixing my eyes on the wood line and see something walking like all right that's just tree branches and stuff like that i i know what that is okay i'm not too worried about that maybe they just got spooked by something (laughs) this thing is stepped out of the wood line onto the food plot vic i froze again how could this be happening there's more how big is the pack because if there's there's one and now there's two in this close this one was a little different. It was a little darker. The way it looked, though, exactly the same. Extremely short gray fur up on the snout, muzzle, up under the eyes. Same muscle definition. The fur was actually a little bit shorter than the first one, and it was a little darker. I froze again. What? How is this really happening again? Well, it kind of looked in my area, knew the stand was there, but I'm not dumb now. I ducked out of the window. I seen one. Now I see two. I don't need to keep staring at it. I'm all the way good at this point. So I slowly move from in front of the window, behind the little screen. Ultimately, I had my back and my head leaning up against the side wall. I kind of heard what sounded like it was running. It started running a little bit. Hopefully it's just running out. It's done. It's gone. Whatever. And when I put my head back in front of the window, I seen it. I don't want to say walking, but it was like a fast, fast paced trot. Still on two legs for about, it almost looked like it, it was picking up speed, I guess to say, just to make it, you know, simple. And then, you know, got down four legs, started running, and it was running in the same direction that we would go to get back to that hunting spot. Now, like I said, 30, 40 miles away in the country, it's easy for creatures, critters to travel undetected. But the next morning after we went back, and I didn't even, I didn't even bring this one up. I had already got his reaction from the night before. 
we walked back to the food plot. We had back, we had a gut pile back there. And we had a bunch of squirrels and a couple of rabbits, but it was mostly, it was mostly our fish, our fish guts and fish carcasses that we'd put back there. And it was scattered. It was tore right apart. The wild thing about it though was there were tracks around where it was tore apart, where it was picked through, but there was none directly. If you would walk up and be standing over something and your tracks are going to be right there next to it. It was like, I don't know, maybe two feet, three feet behind or around. So the arm length out of the tracks and here, but you can clearly tell that something's been digging in this pot. And the strange thing is it was, I don't, I don't mean to gross any of the listeners out, but fish heads, squirrel, rabbit, was a lot of the heads and the organs were gone. No gut sack, no bone. That was all, all left there. It was organs, heads. And it just looked like it was being picked up, like somebody's just gorging on ribs and just tossing the bones down, eating, tossing bones down, eat, toss bones down digging through, making a mess. And it was very scary to say the least. And at that point, my brother had to accept the fact that there was something unnatural going on. There's something unnatural here. And we looked at the tracks. I pointed it out, put my hand next to it, bigger than my hand, the hind track I'm assuming it was. It didn't look like what you think at this point this creature would would look like. The track was still very much a extremely large canine track. And when I say extremely large, I'm I'm roughly five eleven and my brother is six three. His hand and it was still had maybe a quarter to a half inch around his hand. That's big. That's, that's pretty big. So we, you know, talked about it a little bit and just left it at that, went back to the house and he actually ended up moving. He went to the Navy and he ended up not going back there. He stayed in Bay City. He didn't go back there. He came back to the city, ultimately moved farther down south now where he's not so secluded i guess you would say it's definitely stuck with me i it gives me nightmares i don't i don't like going in the woods but i still do just for the simple fact is if it wanted me it could have had me i'm not gonna change my lifestyle around a fear that something i've seen 120 miles away is now going to be here. When I go hunting now, I'm only 10 miles total from my actual house. When my fiance and I go fishing, we usually go to a lot of areas where there's a lot of people. I mean, we do go trout fishing a lot, steelhead fishing. There's still areas that are populated by trout fishermen and other fishermen. That's part of my fear now. I never want to experience something like that ever again. For the first time by myself, I went out hunting last year. So 2021, and this happened in 2012. 2021 was the first year I went back out by myself. I hunted the evening, first night. (laughs) I hightailed it out of there before the sun was even close to going down. The second night, though, the second night I went out, I told my fiance, look, I'm just going to go out. She knows all about this, but I don't like talking to her about it because she don't believe me. She scoffs at the idea, almost like my brother and anybody else I've talked to about it. So I went out and 10 miles total from home, but I was sitting in my blind at like 3.30 in the morning. Well, before the sun came up, 
And I just kind of want to try and just push myself through it. And it was very, very frightening. It was a very frightening experience. Yeah, it was hard. It was real hard. I did end up getting a deer, though, that morning. So that was a plus. But I, I still, after, I had, I didn't go back to that spot. And this was during archery season. I didn't go back for rifle because left the guts in the field, obviously. Well, what are the chances of that second account happening a, a day later? Not down for risking anything like that anymore. Like, I'm all the way okay on that. This year, I'll find a new spot close to home, not too close. Definitely not anywhere near the spot I was at last year. You know, that's how it's physically changed my life. It physically altered my pattern. It's a hard thing to cope with. Now, where I work, it's a house with an adjacent farm field. You know, I work third shift, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. And I'm a smoker, so when I step outside in the back, coyotes are going crazy. Just trigger something in me, I guess. Take a few hits off my cigarette, and I'm, I'm done. I want to go back in. Motion sensor light will go on outside. I freak out a little bit. And I've never had an experience at a house, so it's easy to brush that off. It's just the fact it's almost the same setting. Like I step outside in the back, and it, I'm seeing the same thing, minus a barn and a corral. It's definitely changed the way I think, the way I move, my sleeping. Definitely the most important thing that it's messed up for me, which is unfortunate, but try and get through it as best as I can. Well, it goes without saying, it's not easy at all to deal with. I think you deserve a lot of credit for doing as well as you are. Before we talk about the particulars of your encounters, Dwayne, I want to ask you a general question. There are people out there who see it as being poetic justice whenever a hunter is traumatized by a dogman encounter. What are your thoughts on that? Everybody kills something to eat. There's nothing okay with telling somebody, I'm, whether I believe it or not, I'm glad that happened to you. And maybe it should have got you. Why? Because I want to eat healthy. I want to feed my family the way I was fed, the way my dad and my mother were fed growing up. People just need to open their eyes and see it's a way of life. And it's no different, really, than you somebody walking through a mall and having somebody come up and scare the living daylights out of them, you know, put the fear of God into them and run off and just act like nothing happened. It's no different in my opinion. That's no different. You're doing what you like and you get terrorized doing it. I'm doing what I like and I, it happens to me. We're the same with different experiences. I'm sorry that my experience is with something that we can't explain right now. But eventually, we will be able to. I'm sure of it. Yeah, it really is a shame that anyone would feel that way, but unfortunately, some people do. Would you say the first encounter you had was more traumatic than the one you had at your brother's house, or vice versa, and why so? Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely, because... I didn't even have anybody nearby. My brother was four or 500 yards behind me. Well, what's he going to do? Even if he tries firing something down, there's no way it's going to help me any. It knew it could have me if it wanted. And I knew that it knew that. And that level of intelligence from it being so close and just staring at each other, I didn't want to move. It really messed me up. So, yeah, definitely that first one was way, way worse than, than the other one. And especially when it started walking towards my tree, smelling around, I thought right then and there, I, I was done, So The second one, it wanted nothing to do with the blind. It wanted nothing to do with me there. I believe fully, wholeheartedly that that gut pile is probably what masked my scent. So that first one, man, that one will definitely be with me forever. Oh, I'm sure it will be, but 
how you deal with it, that's all that matters. When you had that first encounter and got the impression the dogman had finally left the area, did the thought that another one might have been around ever cross your mind? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I told my brother, no, I just want to sit for a little bit. I just want to sit, gather my thoughts. I wanted to make sure that there was nothing else trailing behind it. It crossed my mind. It was there. It was in the front of my mind for probably a good five, ten minutes. But I can't just stay in my tree stand all night because I'm scared. When they tell you there's nothing there in the dark that's not there in the light, you're wrong. I believe we're always, always being watched by something. And whether it's one, two, three, or four, it's there. Thank God it was just that one. Now, whether it was two and the first one was just kind of feeling the area, ultimately, yeah, I just, it was just the one that night. And I'm, I thank God every night that, <laughs> that that's how it was. I don't know how I would have been able to handle two at once. Probably not very well. Yeah, it definitely would have made a bad situation even worse. When you met up with your brother that night and decided not to tell him the whole truth about what you experienced in your stand, did you ever feel any guilt about not telling him? A little bit. Just because, man, what if he goes out there? What if he wants to go back to that spot? But I kind of knew that he wasn't going to go back because I fired off my whole magazine. We were always taught you mess up a spot, you cause too much ruckus in one spot, you're going to blow that whole area. There was definitely, maybe subconsciously, part of the reason why I fired off the rest of my rounds. But, yeah, it was always there. Well, what if he does go back and, and I'm not there with him or he goes by himself? I just had to trust that, you know, my dad taught us right. Never go out deep into the woods by yourself never go without a compass if you do but really what's a compass going to do in a situation like that that's true it's not going to do much you told us about the black figure you saw holding that coffee can with the fire in it how sure are you or aren't you that it was a person in a black outfit that you saw doing that somehow i'm not sure it was a person at all who would be that far back in a national forest by themselves and you got to think now they got to have some kind of protective gloves because even if you put five pair of jersey gloves on or your best leather gloves underneath them oven mitts you're only going to be able to hold that coffee can for so long why would somebody do that and it didn't disappear when we went past we could still see it until it was out of our sight I wish I could explain it, but there's just too much to add on at that point. I still feel fully that it had something to do with what happened in my stand, but there's no way I could really say for sure. It's just a very peculiar situation. Yeah, I'd say it is. I wish I could explain that one too, but yeah, unfortunately I can't. When you were up there in your stand and saw that dog man stand up, how tall would you say it was? I'd say probably six and a half, seven feet. When it stood fully, looked up, it was probably about six, seven feet. I'd say maybe closer to seven. So it wasn't a big dog man, but it was more than big enough to get your attention. Oh, yeah. It was just the muscle definition is that and the intelligence side of it. No, I get it. I definitely do. How would you describe that first dog man that you saw as leg structure? Was it more like the legs of a canine or that of a hominid? It was definitely more canine-like. It really looked, you know, at first like a big wolf. A giant wolf just stood up. Well, like I told you before, it's a lot to wrap your mind around, but what happened happened. You can't go back and change that. So, that's all there is to it. You said that your brother's property is only about 30 to 40 miles from where you had that first experience. Is it possible to get to his house from where you were hunting that day in the Huron National Forest 
without leaving forest cover. I mean, you would have to cross the highway, or not the highway, but I guess the expressway, US 23 it is. You'd have to jet across that, but from the forest to his yard, oh, absolutely. I mean, north up into the area where he was living, US 23, it's only a two lane going through the city, so the little town that it was in. It wouldn't be hard for something to dash across real quick in the cover of night disappear back into more woods. That's a good point. Yeah, I'm sure wouldn't have had any trouble making it there then. You said your brother moved shortly after the two of you saw those prints behind his home. How sure are you that he moved because of finding them and not for some other reason? Well, he wouldn't go past the barn after that. Once he reached the barn, and there was, leave the back of the house, there's a little cement patio, and we had a little shed where we kept all the toys. We had a little sand rail in there, a couple of dirt bikes and a four-wheeler. So it was a decent sized shed. Ten yards, we had the barn, the hayloft, so it was a pretty big barn. So it was maybe 50 yards from the back of his house total. He wouldn't go past it. He would go up to the pen where the horses were and they were out. That's about it. He never told me for sure, but I like to think I know my brother. I kind of feel like maybe it's part of it. It'd be a good part of it. Oh, I'm sure you're right. Yeah, a lot of people would have moved after finding those prints. It's not just him. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Dwayne. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, if anybody's out hiking, don't go by yourself. Please do not go by yourself. There's things out there that are deep in the forest, in the woods, that we don't know are there. Science doesn't know they're there yet. Anything could happen. Think of uh, this movie I watched, this little documentary I watched on Amazon Prime called The uh, Missing 411, The Hunted. It sheds a lot of light on stuff like that, and so uh, I wouldn't recommend it. You could disappear quick. Like I said earlier on, you're always being watched. Always. As much as you think your eyes are going and you're well aware of your surroundings, there's always going to be something there that has its eyes on you. You are not aware of One wrong move, I think, could mess a lot of things up for people. So just be safe. Don't go unarmed. Definitely don't think any kind of firearm would, from a single person at least, would do you any good, but definitely protect yourself. Well, that's all very well said. Very well said. Well, Dwayne, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing the details of those experiences with us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, Beck. Uh, I'm just glad I was finally able to get it out and talk with somebody who understands and have some like-minded individuals who who understand as well and nobody's really alone in this that's right you're far from alone if you ever need me in the future like i told you please let me know because i'll be there for you but having said that thanks again so much for coming on and have a great night